Hello, everybody. We're just waiting for some more folks to join us and we're going to get started with our adaptive actions webinar with the Ecology Action Center in just a few minutes. So thanks for joining us. Welcome Bob and Carolyn and Elizabeth and Katie and Nancy and Laura. So great that you could be with us all today. If you're just joining us on Facebook, thank you. Uh, and we're just gonna wait a couple more minutes so we can have some more people participating in today's webinar. Hi Hudson, thanks for joining us. Hi Janet. Hi Linda. It's so great that you guys can all be joining us today. You know, it's very hot. Perhaps you're seeking refuge from the summer sun. Perhaps you're outside enjoying it. We might just give a couple more minutes uh, our attendance keeps going up. We want to make sure everyone gets the chance to fully participate today. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Akshita. Paul's joining us. Hi, Winnie. Thanks for joining today. Wow. Okay, so I think we're going to get started and I hope that uh, a few more people can join us um, as we are doing that. So hello and welcome to the Ecology Action Center's third webinar series today, Adaptive Actions. Today we're going to be discussing some of the great work of the EAC and uh, how we've adapted internally to execute our work, um, as well as some of the ways that municipalities and individuals uh, are also adapting or having the opportunity to adapt in these very strange times. Um, my name is Dana and I'm the Community Giving Manager at the Ecology Action Center and I'm also your host today. Uh, Hope Perez and Ron Swain are behind the scenes and they're going to be taking care of all the technical logistics for us. So thank you to both of them uh, for sharing their busy schedules with us today. Um, before we begin today's webinar, uh, or rather we would like to begin today's webinar by acknowledging the fact that we are gathering online today um, across the province and maybe beyond, um, but certainly here in Nova Scotia on unceded, unsurrendered Mi'kmaq territory. Uh, as we discuss issues of our shared environment, climate change and justice, it's important and I would say even critical to remember our relationship to this land and to follow the leadership from the Mi'kmaq people in their continued relationship to this land, mi'kmaq since time immemorial. Most of us are visitors here on this territory and we ask that we all consider this as we continue with today's webinar. So for those of you who are turning, tuning in and might not be too familiar with our work, the Ecology Action Center is a member-based environmental charity officially located here in Halifax. Although again, of course, we are gathering uh, remotely from across the province today. The EAC takes leadership on critical environmental issues from biodiversity protection to climate change to environmental justice. I'm going to give you a brief rundown of our agenda for today. 
Uh, we encourage you to attend all of the sessions, but if you're unable to, uh, I'll let you know how this afternoon will roll out. Beginning shortly, we're going to hear from four staff members who will educate uh, and engage us for about 15 minutes. And then there'll be some time to answer questions from you, the audience, our wonderful audience. Annika Riapella is our Welcoming Wheels coordinator at the EAC, and she'll be speaking to us in just a minute on an initiative that she's calling Pedal Through the Pandemic. Uh, following her, we're going to have our wonderful transportation staff member, Kelsey Lane, uh, discussing safe streets and temporary infrastructure during COVID-19. Then at 2 p.m., we're going to switch gears, no pun intended, maybe slightly, and hear from Amy Gasparetto, EAC's Senior Coordinator, Community Food, on local food systems in this unprecedented time. And finally, we'll wrap up with Karen McKendry, our Wilderness Outreach Coordinator, as she discusses the benefits of nature and how we can make the most of it this summer. As I mentioned already, we do plan to save some time at the end for uh, questions, so don't be shy. Our presenters are excited to answer your questions about the topics they're presenting on. Uh, we might not have time to get to all of your questions, but hopefully we can get through most of them. And you can type your questions related to the presentations in the Q&A box below if you're joining us on Zoom. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can write your questions in the comments and uh, our great team will pass that information along and we'll try to get to those too. And uh, one more thing before we get started, the Ecology Action Center is only able to be as effective as we are because of our members. As our Adaptive Actions webinar title suggests, the landscape of our work is rapidly changing. And as a member-based organization, it's because of small monthly and annual donations that we're able to be in a position of resilience today and continue our work despite all of the challenges that have presented themselves in the last three months. So thank you to all of our members. We could not do it without you. And if you aren't already a, a, member, a member of the Ecology Action Center, um, please consider joining today. A small monthly donation does really go a long way in supporting this important work. And the more people that join us as members only helps to amplify our collective voice and create greater change for the environment at a time where it's never been more critical. Um, every membership and donation does go to the continued work of the Ecology Action Center, of course, and so in advance, thank you so much for your support. Okay, so let's get started. As promised, our first presenter of the day is Annika Riapel. Annika is our Welcoming Wheels Coordinator here at the Ecology Action Center, and she'll be speaking today about Pedal Through the Pandemic. Uh, which is an initiative to put bicycles into the hands of people who need them. Um, she'll discuss how EAC has combined creativity, volunteer capacity, and community support to bring the program to life, as well as the positive impact that it's had on our communities. So thank you so much, Annika. I'll let you take it from here. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen here real quick. All right. So thank you, Dana, for that lovely introduction. Um, uh, my name's Anika. I'm the Welcoming Wheels Coordinator with, uh, with the Ecology Action Center. Um, so today I'm going to jump right into um, some of our programming and how we've adapted. Um, but I felt it might be useful uh, to kind of quickly go over um, some of the programming that we currently offer and or had offered and then and then and then kind of talk about how we've um, adapted and, and pivoted to provide that. Um, so the first thing I'll talk about is welcoming wheels, which is which is uh, my uh, my uh, uh, main focus of my work. Um, so Welcoming Wheels was started in 2015 um, in response to the influx of Syrian uh, refugees in Nova Scotia. Um, the program partners with ISANS and with the Halifax Refugee Clinic. Um, we receive bikes from the community. We have a team of volunteers who fix them up on Friday nights. Um, this is a combination of 
of locals uh, and newcomers who work on the bikes, uh, people who know everything about bikes, and people who uh, people who who are there to learn and, and know very little. So the, that's a big part of it of learning how to repair bikes. And then we ran run gifting uh, sessions where we match. Um, clients from ISANS or Halifax Refugee Cl Clinic with the bikes as, as well as helmets, lights, uh, locks, bells, and um, yeah, about like an hour of safe cycling um, education so that uh, people are aware of the road rules in Nova Scotia and, and how to ride safely on our roads. Um, so that's the Welcoming Wheels program. Um, Bike Again is uh, another EAC program. Um, it has been around for 20 years. It is a volunteer run DIY bike workshop. Um, so uh, I think there's something truly incredible about Bike Again and that the fact that it has been around for 20 years and is, is run just through the, the power of, of volunteers. Um, bike Again functions uh, as a, a, a workshop space where uh, members of the public can come in and work on their own bikes. They can access tools and volunteers are around to help help people out and answer questions. Um, and as well, Bike Again also fix ups, fix, fixes up donated bikes and those are available for purchase at, at affordable rates. Um, so a lot of stuff happening in that space. Um, currently, Bike Again and Welcoming Wheels share a workshop um, on Charles Street at 5664 uh, on Charles Street. Um, which is a, a place of, of uh, a, a lot of a lot's happen in there. Uh, finally, um, the pop-up bike hub uh, was a new or is a new initiative um, that was supposed to launch this spring. Uh, the concept behind the pop-up bike hub was to to address the the issue that there are a lot of communities in Nova Scotia, but even in HRM, that don't have access to um, to the peninsula, to bike shops, to uh, spaces where they can fix their own bikes up. So the pop-up bike hub is a cargo trailer. Um, it has, um, it's fully outfitted with bike tools, with little kits, with repair stands. And the idea behind it was to travel to different communities um, and basically offer the same services that Bike Again um, offers. So I, I've playfully call it bike again on wheels or a mini bike again on wheels sometimes. So that was supposed to launch um, this spring. Um, so those are our programs. And then um, the last thing I'll talk about before I jump into to where we're going um, is just a really quick slide about why bikes, um, uh, why we, why these programs exist, um, why they're important, why, uh, you know, folks are passionate about it. Um, so um, bikes right now, we're certainly seeing is uh, ev everyone, bikes are the hottest thing on, on the market right now. Um, and uh, these programs all uh, help people who, are, who, who may not be able to access them for a variety of reasons, uh, ac access them. It's an important equity piece. Um, but it's also important bikes are um, an incredible form of transportation. Um, they're fast, um, uh, they're convenient. Um, if you can't drive or, or are, aren't able to afford to drive, they're much more affordable. Um, if right now we're definitely seeing a lot of people who are uncomfortable taking public transit and are looking for other forms of transportation, um, bikes are really affordable. Um, there are physical and, and um, mental benefits of riding a bike. There's a lot of studies about um, um, riding a bike being part of your daily physical activity, about the um, mental well-being um, aspects of it. Uh, as well, there's a lot of studies uh, that are coming out, certainly with the newcomer population, um, that demonstrate that uh, people who ride bikes um, generally have a, a deeper sense of belonging in their community, and that um, people who feel that they belong in their community uh, tend to have um, health indicators that, uh, uh, higher health indicators, both uh, both physical and, and well-being indicators. So I think that that's really interesting and exciting. And then finally, because we're the EAC, we're obviously a big fan of a, a mode of transportation that has a very low carbon footprint. So that's why that's why we do this. Um, so um, this is this is the pivot right here. Um, in this moment, uh, we're responding to a, a global pandemic, but also these big conversations that are happening about our complicity, complicity and role um, in, in these systemic 
uh, structures uh, in our society. Uh, so uh, these are all kind of things that that we're thinking about as we as we move through and, and adapt and respond. Um, so this first part, I'm calling it the quick pivot. Um, essentially, uh, when when uh, oh man, what was it? March um, when things shut down. Um, you know, welcoming wheels had to stop all of our repair nights. We weren't allowed to um, do any of our gifting sessions, which have big gatherings of groups. Bike Again's uh, repair nights were all uh, closed down um, and the trailer didn't launch. So we, we immediately hit a wall with all of our programming. That being said, um, we figured ways around it. Uh, welcoming wheels, uh, we're continuing to give bikes out to the community. Uh, this is a example of what that looks like. So uh, for the first couple months, I was driving bikes out to uh, locations that were close to participants um, or clients' homes. Um, I was locking them up um, and taping a package uh, with safe cycling information that was translated into Arabic uh, to the bikes. And then I was calling our interpreter and uh, she was uh, communicating with the families to make sure that they were getting their bikes. So through the welcoming wheel drops, we've given away 37 bikes uh, to date. Um, as well, I've had a couple of our volunteers uh, who are able to and have space um, and have garages basically, um, who have been also working on bikes. So I've been dropping bikes off and picking bikes up and, you know, wiping everything down. So we've adapted um, and, and, you know, we have, we have so many wonderful volunteers and, and, uh, and, and people who are willing to kind of work with us. So that's been truly special. Um, the Pedal Through the Pandemic program um, is the initiative that Bike Again um, has championed. Um, I want to make sure that the praise is um, upon, the praise is, is, is with the, the volunteers of Bike Again. Um, uh for for that um essentially because bike again was closed um they also had a bunch of bikes that had been repaired over the winter um and so we were able to receive some funding from the province uh basically to um purchase those bikes from bike again and then give them away to uh community partners so uh we reached out to um uh, food banks to uh youth organizations to uh, halfway houses uh, to the mobile uh, to Mosh, which is the mobile street uh, health team, um, both in HRM and outside. Um, and so through that, we partnered with with uh, different organizations that support marginalized people and and got bikes out um, through that. So we're still that's still ongoing. Um, we also reached out to there is a bike again in Yarmouth um, and uh, not affiliated with us, but. Uh, you know, much love. Um, uh, and so we were also able to um, hook them up some, with some funding so that they could, they could also get um, more bikes out um, in, in these times. Um, so all together with that, we're, we've got uh, almost over, uh, almost 80 bikes out into the community um, with the pedal through the pandemic. Um, and, then, and then on top of that, the, the 37 bikes that Welcoming Wheels has given away to date. So that's really exciting. Um, we're hearing a lot of really great stories, people who are reaching out um, uh, um, because they're frontline workers um, in the healthcare systems and they were really concerned about being on public transit because they didn't want to get other people sick and they didn't want to get sick. And so, yeah, the, we've, we've, it, it feels really good um, to, be, to be able to help and support people um, uh, through this, this period. Um, and finally, uh, the pop-up bike hub, um, uh, COVID style. Um, so we decided to uh, pivot in response. We basically set up the pop-up bike hub um, as a, uh, a more like a bike shop. Um, so we provided free, or we are providing free 20 minute tune-ups um, to the public. So uh, following the same procedures that bike shops are following, uh, people are dropping bikes off, we're putting air in the tires, we're aligning brakes and we're lubing up chains. And also if there are, you know, substantial problems that make a bike unsafe, we're letting people know and, and providing them a li with a list of bike shops in the area um, that they can bring their bikes to. Um, so basically, you know, making sure that, that, that people can participate in riding. It's, it's, uh, it's a great COVID activity. 
Um, so the trailer was in Clayton Park for two weeks, um, just behind Canada Game Center. Um, we hired uh, two, two mechanics uh, to help out with that. Um, and currently the trailer traveled up yesterday to Millbrook First Nations, just outside of Truro, um, and it will be there for two weeks um, as well. Um, so that's really exciting. That's where I was yesterday, which was great. Um, so we've got our mechanic up there who's who's traveling up and 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 tuning up bikes um, as well as uh, giving away some helmets and lights and locks. So really great, really exciting, and we're certainly um, receiving a lot of enthusiastic response from the community of and other communities who are like, oh, can we can we get the trailer up here? So I'm looking forward as we obviously everything's changing constantly, um, and um, as as we start to reopen. Um, of where we're going and, and how we continue to adapt and respond to this. But I think I think the, the trailer is an excellent example of how when we create programs that are adaptable, then we we allow ourselves to be agile to respond to changing situations. Um, that being said, that's that's the pivot, that's the fast and easy stuff. I think it's important also right now to when we're when we're thinking about these systemic um, structures that we are all part of about the big work um, and the opportunities, um, the, the opportunities to, to make the world a more just place. Um, I, you know, these are symbolic photos of working on bikes because this is, this is the, you know, the nuts and bolts of things. Um, so I think, I believe really firmly that we can always, um, we can always do better, that, that it's important even when we're running programming or even when we're, we're doing the good work to to look at the work that we're doing and to look at how we can grow and improve and deepen the impact. Um, so, so I think that this, for me, this is, I, I love bikes. Um, but I think that all of these programs, bike again, um, welcoming wheels, uh, and the pop-up bike hub, it's not just about bikes. It's, it's about the other things that come with bikes. And I think community is a really, um, a really amazing thing that can come out of it when people come together around a, a shared interest. Um, I have no idea how much time I'm going to keep talking. So that's fun. Um, this picture is, uh, fills my heart with joy. Um, every year we have, um, uh, we have a celebration party. Um, a couple years ago when we moved into our new space, we had a joint, um, shop opening party with bike again, um, in, on Charles street when we moved in there and I had reached out and invited uh, a bunch of the families who who participate in the Welcoming and Wheels program um, and I hadn't heard anything back from them and so I was like okay cool well we'll just get some hot dogs and we'll you know some veggie dogs and and that'll be that'll be the party and I guess I guess no one's gonna come from the, from the Welcoming Wheels community but at least we'll have some bike again folks and community members hanging out the night before I uh, got a call from our interpreter and she was like hey I've got five families coming I was like, great that's awesome I woke up the next morning out of like a dead sleep and was like, oh my God, I can't, I can't buy hot dogs. That's not, I, it's not the food. So I was in a total panic. I called my interpreter. She was like, no problem. She gave me a list. I went to the Syrian meat shop and, and bought meat and she made like an, an onion herb garlic mixture. Um, and then uh, we showed up and we mixed everything together and we, we uh, grilled up some kafta and I immediately got kicked off of barbecue duty, which was supposed to be my job, but I, I they took over. And, and it ended up being this like really amazing thing where we had a, a big mix of people and people were sharing food and it was kind of spontaneous and, and last minute and maybe a little bit chaotic, but it, it ended up being like a really, really wonderful day. And I think that that, that is the power of, of, um, of these, these types of programs is, is bringing people together and sharing food and, and, and you know, um, that, that's powerful. Um, I think it's also important um, on top of like looking to create these moments of, of bringing people together also to really look at at um at equity and so even though we're working with the marg marginalized communities with the welcoming wheels program um we know within those marginalized communities there are there are people who are also marginalized so um a huge percentage of our participants are um or a predominant percentage of our, our participants are are men um, or young children. We we don't have as many um, adult uh, women working or participating, um, and and so often I, I when I when when I'm looking and, and reflecting on our programming, it's you know who's there, who's not there, 
and why aren't they there and going out and asking those questions and, and getting getting feedback from the community and so we've realized that um, child care is a huge barrier um, for a lot of women who have young children and don't have anyone to leave them with um, and so you know then that inspires me to start I'm currently looking for different partnerships with other organizations to be able to provide uh, child care for events so that 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 more people can can participate um, and then uh, this is a uh, in the last year, we've also been pivoting and, and looking to create, um, again, this idea of more meaningful connections um, and, and uh, um, uh, deeper relationships with people. So last year, we piloted a, a, a bike buddy program, which brings a, a local and a newcomer together, um, and they go on bike rides uh, for, uh, uh, for six weeks for, for a couple hours every week. And the idea behind it is you know, the, 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 the idea of riding and learning. So, you know, working through their, their neighborhoods, their areas, the challenges, whether it's a roundabout or a really busy road, um, but also showing people things like the trails in, in their community, uh, the free events, the seaport market, all of these things are, um, are kind of benefits. Um, and one of the things that we've, we've realized through the Bike Buddy program and uh, is that, it allows us to create champions within communities. And, and once we, we really build these relationships, um, then, then we have more people who are being brought in because they're, they're their friends, they're their neighbors, they're their family. Um, so that's been really, really cool and really powerful. And so those are, those are certainly moving forward um, uh, approaches that we're gonna continue. And then I think the last thing, and I know I'm like just blabbing away here, um, uh, I like to end on food. I, I think this really encompasses it together. Food's always a really important part of our volunteer nights. Um, we, you know, we, we take anyone, you don't have to have any crazy skill levels. You don't have to, we, we often have people who tell us that they, they don't think that they can volunteer because their, their English skills aren't high enough, um, which is often, uh, completely untrue. Um, but also that, you don't need to be able to speak the same language to work on a bike together and to learn from each other, um, which is, I, I think, really beautiful as well. Um, and then when we take these moments and we hang out and we have pizza at all of our volunteer nights, very important to have pizza there. Um, so we have these moments to, to, uh, to stand back. And I, I often find that the conversations that happen over pizza um, every week are always really beautiful. And, and this is where we build relationships, um, not, not just, um, the EAC, but our, our volunteers with, with newcomers, um, and with members of the community and even our volunteers, we have, oh, you know, retirees and, and teenagers and, and everyone has a shared interest. And so I think that's really the power of it as we move forward. Um, and we, we ha are having these big conversations about adjust recovery. Um, I, I, I really believe, um, that, that bikes are going to play a really important part of that and that programming um, that looks not only to, to get bikes out into the community to those who, who, who for whatever reason, aren't able to access them, um, but also programming that inspires um, community, um, equity, and champions. Um, so I think I'm going to stop talking. Um, and I don't know if there's, I, I'm not sure how this whole question thing is going to happen. Uh, thank Let's you so much, Annika. That was amazing and uh very inspiring and i i might just say you know i've had the opportunity to work uh with annika and to be able to um connect her as well with different members of our community welcoming wheels is an initiative that is um, funded partially through the support of our members and so uh, we really appreciate that they've been able to make this incredible and inspiring initiative possible. Um, I'm wondering uh, maybe while we're waiting for folks to ask some questions if any I, I think perhaps you did such a good job explaining everything that there might not be too many of them but i'll take my liberties uh, <laughs> to maybe ask how do you build uh, sort of the network so that people know that this program exists in the new canadian community um yeah i think uh partnerships are 
fundamental to um to to all of the work that I do. Um, I, I think often it's important to realize that you don't have to recreate a wheel. Um, that if you just you reach out. So ISANS is is amazing. The Halifax Refugee Clinic does amazing work, and they're already connected to a lot of people um, as well. Um, and it, it's always really astonishing when I have conversations with people um, what other programs exist out there that, that, that I'm unaware of. So the library, um, I'm learning how many amazing programs that the libraries have, um, for newcomers that is like an entirely different group of people. So reaching out and, and finding out who's already doing the work and then allowing those, them to connect you with, with others, um, as well as the people in our programs often bring other people. So sometimes people come in, we have a, like an earn a bike program where, um, people can come in and volunteer and, and learn. And then, you know, we hook them up with a bike and often, um, they'll, you know, the next week they'll bring their friends, their family, their, you know, their classmate, their colleague. Um, so those have all been re really, we, we don't have a lot of problems <laughs> finding people to participate in the program. Um, uh, so, so yes, I don't know if that answered it, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess I wonder if like, like if word of mouth is something that's quite common as well. If somebody's a beneficiary of a of the program, if uh, it's common for for them to, you know, pass that information along. So yeah. like, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Please do please share far and wide. And, and same thing with um the people donating bikes as well, right? We, we, uh, we're always uh, always accepting bikes with uh, with open arms. So that's another and great way that people can help out. And how would we do that if we have an extra bike in our garage or in our basement or wherever? Uh, how would we actually go about and um, make that donation at this time? Yeah. So um, uh, you can shoot me an email um, at www.ecologyaction.ca or literally you can just drop bikes off at bike again. Um, so that's uh, 5664 Charles Street. Um, and uh, um, that, yeah, you can leave the bikes outside. There's a lock that's um, open. So if you have a higher end bike that you wanna make sure uh, gets to the people, um, you can just lock it up um, or you can just leave the bikes there. The, the community in the area is, is, we've, is has never bothered those bikes. People are generally um, really good about that. Um, and then uh, likewise, um, if Bike Again is open, they're uh, usually open on Wednesdays and Thursday nights, and we're usually there on Friday nights uh, with the Welcoming Wheels program. Um, so if you drop it off during during that time, um, we'll just take them and then. Um, likewise, if you have bikes and you don't uh, don't have the means to transport it, I often will also pick up bikes as well. So you can shoot me an email. Amazing. Okay, well, thank you so much, Annika, uh, for taking the time to share with us today. And thanks to everybody here who's participating as well for being a part of our webinar. Um, if you're just joining us now, my name is Dana and I'm the Community Giving Manager at the Ecology Action Center as well as your host for today uh, for our Adaptive Actions webinar. Uh, I hope that you'll feel energized by everything you learned today and maybe you can keep the conversation going, um, tell your friends and family about programs like Welcoming Wheels and the other um, initiatives that we're going to discuss today. And if you like what you're hearing on the webinar today and you're in a position to do so, uh, perhaps consider becoming a member of the Ecology Action Center. Uh, it's the backbone of our work at the EAC and it's because of our members that we're able to be as adaptive and resilient as we are uh, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so thank you to everyone who's already a member. And if you are interested, uh, I think we can get one of uh, either Hope or Rowan to put a link in the chat below. So our, uh, our next speaker now is Kelsey Lane, who is our Sustainable Transportation Coordinator at the Ecology Action Center. 
She's going to discuss how HRM is adapting. So the Halifax Regional Municipality is adapting our streets and making it safer for people to walk, bike, or roll. And what this moment has taught us about how to build back a better transportation system in the future. As a reminder, at the end of Kelsey's presentation, we hope to have time to take some questions from the audience and you were far too quiet during the last presentation. So please write your questions for Kelsey in the Q&A box on your screen uh, or in the um, chat if you uh, are on Facebook. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And now without further ado, here's Kelsey. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I'm just going to pull out my presentation here. Oh. Fantastic. Great. So yeah, thank you again for, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I just wanted to thank Annika as well for her presentation. Um, we do work on the same team, so it is a privilege to, to work alongside her and her passion and her energy every single day. Uh, as mentioned, I am going to chat to you today about transportation in the time of COVID and talk a little bit about particularly the, the slow streets approach or the infrastructure implementation that we have seen in Halifax. So I like to contextualize and just kind of start off the presentation for why EAC even works on, on this sector and in this sector. And it's because currently right now, 28% of GHG emissions in Nova Scotia are produced by transportation particularly single occupancy vehicles and single combustion engines. So it is a, a really important aspect of uh, building back better, of the clean recovery, of um, making sure that we have a sustainable future. And of course, um, lots of folks and, and the province and the municipality does recognize this and they have been working on it. And there's been, a numer there's been numerous plans, uh, especially for the past 10 years that have tried to focus and reshift our priorities when it comes to transportation. And a really notable plan was that it was passed at, in Halifax in 2016 called the Integrated Mobility Plan. And why this was so important, not only was it passed unanimously, but what it said is that we need to reprioritize the transportation system that, and make, make sure that it focuses on sustainable modes, such as transit, such as walking, such as biking, and that from now on, those are going to be the priority over the single occupancy vehicle, not only for the GHG benefit, but also for the health and um, health the equity and the financial benefit that it, that it brings to, municipal, to the municipality. So even before that plan, though, I just kind of wanted to highlight how many people are already using uh, sustainable modes of, of transportation, particularly transit. This is a study conducted in 2016. Uh, by Simon Fraser University, who surveyed over 1,200 people in HRM and across HRM. And what they found is that 20% of people uh, were relying on transit as a primary mode. Now you might say, oh, this is different than the census, but the census only counts the trips to work, whereas the survey was more comprehensive and also counted any trip that you did to the grocery store, to the doctor's appointment, um, to your children's school, et cetera. So it's a really important part of our transportation system, notably. But <laughs> COVID really changed a lot. And one of the things that it changed, particularly in transportation, was uh, the transit system. So where, when you're thinking about that 20% and you think about how they depended on transit and what happens now in a time where there's multiple reasons why um, you know, we, can't, we can't rely on transit in the same way that we used to. One of the reasons at the beginning of this pandemic was that we were told that we had to stay home, so not to go out at all, not to travel uh, beyond getting things that were absolutely necessary. And then beyond that, even as things start to open up, people are still nervous about sharing the space. And where transit was designed to be one of the most efficient systems, packing as many people as is comfortable at, and propelling them in, in kind of the same directions, a very efficient form of transportation, but the circumstances of COVID are not exactly compatible with this. So of course that leaves the question, of what happens to that 20%. And we've had to ask some very difficult uh, questions of ourselves in this moment. And one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is what are we gonna do to support the people who depended on transit to get around? And I'm showing this graph now because it breaks down even further 
who is part of that 20%. And you can see that people with a lower income bracket uh, are more dependent on transit. So 36% more dependent on transit. People who are younger, 34%. Female use transit more than, than uh, male. So how are we going to honor those policy decisions, namely the decision that we made in the integrated mobility plan, which we promised people you would have another option to get around. If you gave up your vehicle, you would have transit, you would have car share, you would have walking, you'd have biking. And what do we do in this moment that we can honor those decisions and make sure that we're still supporting people that they can access their basic needs, even if they don't have a vehicle. And as Annika mentioned, there are so many reasons why people don't and can't and uh, don't use a car to get around. And um, it can be anything from a physical impairment to uh, financial to uh, immigrant status, et cetera. And so this was uh, something that <laughs> advocates and, and uh, groups and, and individuals across the municipality really wanted to ask of our council because it had been weeks since the pandemic and since some of those closures had happened and transit service was compromised and we hadn't really seen any action. So this is an image of Councillor Sean Cleary who really brought the issue to the forefront in council. And we had that discussion and, and we had the discussion about what are we gonna do to compensate for that? What are we gonna do to compensate um, for, for the people that were dependent on transit? And I also just wanted to take this moment um, to recognize that, that um, this is why the work of Annika and Ashley are so important when it comes to the pedal through the pandemic piece because there's a lot of talk about infrastructure. You know, we need to build more bike lanes, we need to um, um, expand the sidewalks, but we also need to recognize that um, that infrastructure is only gonna elevate the people. So a bike lane is only gonna elevate transportation options for the people that already own a bicycle. And so when we're thinking about some of these solutions, we also need to think about how do we make sure that everyone has access to that? So if we're spending money on building out infrastructure and safe streets and bike lanes, how are we making sure that everyone has the opportunity to participate in those changes and in those solutions? And so again, this is a, I really encourage you to look at it if you're a municipal nerd like me, because um, you can kind of see the back and forth about what is the critical issue? Do we need to act on it now? But luckily uh, the motion did pass, not unanimously, but it did pass council. And uh, even though they were predicting it would take about six months to take any action, Two weeks later, we saw the HRM mobility response. And again, this response is uh, focused really on just trying to elevate those other modes of transportation. And you can see it's, uh, it, they, they decided they were gonna do it in a couple phases. So obviously the first phase, it, it didn't reach everywhere. It didn't reach uh, across the peninsula, but it did provide and highlight some streets where they were gonna implement uh, some, some transportation measures that would make it easier to to walk or, or to bike. And the reason they did this, I think it's important to note, is that the width of our sidewalks are narrow. And to pass someone on the sidewalk and maintain a safe physical distance was virtually impossible. And, another, and so you'd notice that when you're walking down the street uh, and trying to get to where you wanted to go by foot. But we also noticed that the roadway wasn't being used as much as it, as it was in the past. So, there's a there's little, little bit of space on the sidewalk, but tons of space on the street. And so how we had to think about how we were gonna reprioritize that public space and think about the needs of, of the people who are now dependent on, on walking and rolling. It's the primary way to get around. And so this is, you've probably seen these around town. This is the slow street uh, signage and there's a pylon. And if it looks really simple, that's because it is. Um, it really is, is quite a simple uh, approach that, that allowed us to implement it really quickly or allowed HRM to implement it really quickly. And it's such a simple solution, but, but it has a huge impact. And all of a sudden, in the span of two weeks, our streets become more than just a space for cars, and they become a space for people. And in these images, you can really see this was just taken a couple days after um, the slow streets was rolled out. And um, you know, I think, I think it's important that we recognize that before the pandemic and, and still currently, 70% of uh, space in Halifax, public space was for vehicles. And so we have an opportunity here to reallocate that and repurpose it. And when you give people the chance, they will use the street not just for, for cars, they'll use it for walking, for biking, but also teaching their kids uh, how to rollerblade or um, playing or things like that. Streets are public spaces and we, we have to be more creative with how we use them. And another notable thing that happened was when uh, we saw the city implement these changes, 
we also saw that some of the businesses followed suit. So this is an example from Dilly Dally down on Quimpool, great coffee shop. These used to be two parking spaces and they uh, converted them. They took out, they said no more parking, but, but we're gonna convert these into a little cafe and, and uh, you know, so you can go and have coffee and enjoy the sunshine. And what a creative and beautiful way to use those two parking spots. Uh, certainly in my mind, it's, a, it's a, better, a better use of public space. And if we imagine what we can do, um, even with that 70% that's allocated to cars in the future moving forward, even if we can think about what are the opportunities here, uh, these little pockets of, of beauty that we can insert into spaces that we just use to store cars, I think we'll, we'll start to open up our imagination and open up our minds and, and think about public space differently. Really, that space that was always allocated um, into vehicles. And so these were some recommendations. So they rolled out the, slow, the first phase of the slow of streets and, and we were all really excited. It was a huge win. And I definitely have to give a ton of credit to all of the organizations that worked so hard um, to raise this concern. And we, in the next phase, we did have some recommendations. We, not, not criticizing how it was rolled out, but just kind of saying these are the things that we want to think about moving forward to the next phase. One of them was inclusive consultation with design that reflects, uh, reflects what the community wants. And there's a really interesting initiative in Portland where they actually use the community to help be ambassadors for the street and steward the street. So if the pylon was out of whack or a planter was knocked over, um, these volunteers were trained to go on the street safely and replace it and actually increase the capacity for the city to keep rolling it out because they weren't so concerned about maintaining, uh, maintaining the streets all of the time. We wanted iterative implementation, which is happening focus on data collection so we can use that data to help inform what the next phase might be. Um, we definitely wanted it to be informed by the new social administra policy administrative order that was passed at council that really puts a social lens on, on some of the placement of this infrastructure. And we wanted to avoid initiatives that rely on law enforcement. And I'm gonna, this one, this last one is the most important one in my mind and I think a lot of the minds of the advocates that um, put these recommendations forward. And I'll go into a little bit of why. <clears throat> so firstly, um, if you look at the second point there, under the Traffic Safety Act, we can't rely on enforcement because sometimes the rules aren't, aren't good enough. Um, and so for slow streets, you can see people using the streets in different ways, walking, biking, uh, rolling, et cetera. But speed really matters when it comes to whether a street will be safe enough to, to use those other modes. And this graphic on the right, you can see the difference between 50 kilometers an hour and 30 kilometers an hour. If you are struck at a vehicle at 50 kilometers an hour, there's a two out of 10 chance that you will survive. At 30 kilometers an hour, you have a nine out of 10 chance that you'll survive. And this is just for the average person. If you're an elderly person or a younger person, that 30 kilometers an hour matters even more. Unfortunately, municipalities do not have the jurisdiction under the, under the Motor Vehicle Act and the new Traffic Safety Act to set the speed limit below 50 kilometers an hour without permission from the province. Have they asked? Absolutely, they've asked, and we haven't received that, that, blanket, uh, that blanket reduction in speed. So the design has to compensate for that. The design has to automatically signal and tell the vehicles, this is a slow street, you need to slow down, whether that's through pylons or infrastructure or a chicane, whatever it is, it's so important that we reduce the speed so that those streets are safe to use for different modes. Secondly, uh, there's a really awkward and, and outdated piece of the Motor Vehicle Act, section 127.2 that says, where sidewalks are provided, it shall be unlawful for any pedestrian to walk along an adjacent highway. Now, what does that mean? It means that uh, if there is a sidewalk present, it is unlawful, it is illegal to use the road, to walk on the road. And as you can imagine, when the sidewalks are too narrow um, and there's no infrastructure there to support you, how complicated that can be. And so uh, fortunately um, for temporary construction zones such as this, it's not illegal to walk in the street if you're in a temporary construction zone such as this. But before this implementation happened, um, you, you had people queued up along the street, waiting in line to get to the grocery store, waiting in line uh, to get to the pharmacy. Um, and trying to pass each other along these really narrow sidewalks. And so you're kind of uh, forced to, <laughs> to choose. Um, do you maintain that safe distance or do you walk out into the street? And I, I think 
The other reason it's so important not to depend on enforcement, particularly in this case, is that as a white person, I, I might take that risk. I might say, yeah, no problem. I don't mind um, unlawfully walking in the street to walk around this group of people that's on the sidewalk that's too narrow. And this is absolutely the case. I mean, you can see there's a tree in the middle of the sidewalk down there. But for me, it might not be such a big deal. If you are a black person living in Halifax and you're six times more likely to receive a traffic violation, I don't know if I would be willing to take that risk. And I don't think that, you know, I don't think anyone, um, anyone should have to choose between those two very important forms of personal safety. And that's why this kind of infrastructure is just, it's so important. I also wanted to note just on that point that the best slow streets approach that we've seen so far is what was implemented in the north end of Halifax, a uh, traditionally black community about five years ago. And there was a, 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 a traffic circle on Creighton Street and um, this was an effort by the community to try and reduce the speeds on the street. People were using these north end local streets as a way to avoid Barrington or avoid bigger, uh, those bigger, more higher volume traffic streets and they were just zooming through here. And so the community was asking the municipality, can you, can you lower the speed limit? Can you put in a crosswalk? Can you put in some kind of speed barrier that will prevent people from speeding through our communities where our kids are trying to play and people are just trying to live? Um, and unfortunately, nothing came through. And you see this, this, this is their response. I mean, it's, um, it's absolutely beautiful, but it's, but it's also heartbreaking. And it's beautiful because if you've had the privilege to experience this, you can see that it reflects the, the creativity, the authenticity, the beauty um, and of the community that created this. But the other really amazing thing about this is that it also serves to make the street safer because those bright colors on the street automatically draw a driver's eye to the street level and they're paying attention to what's in front of them. So they're more likely to see somebody walking across the street. It's heartbreaking because this mural got paved over. And when they repaved the street, they also uh, paved over the potholes that served as a speed barrier and prevented people from speeding through this uh, community as much. And <laughs> again, you know, it's not as though they didn't ask and it's not as though they didn't say this is what we need and this is what we want. But the fact that we, you know, even if the intent was to do a good thing and pave the community, the fact that we didn't listen to what was actually needed and actually wanted is a lesson that we're still trying to learn. And despite the excitement that was generated around the efficacy of this slow street streets movement here in Halifax, the question we are left with is efficacy for who? Safe streets for who? And the veil of excuses has been lifted on our intentions and our abilities. Um, you know, we have proven we can make safe streets in less than two weeks. And so why does it take a pandemic to listen to what the community has been telling us for years? And our response, you know, again, it's just, it's just proven that we have so much work to do when it comes to understanding racism and understanding, understanding equity, at least especially in the transportation sector. And moving forward, advocates, planners, politicians, business owners, community members, people who care have to put ourselves and our efforts and our support behind actions and, and behind the people and the voices that have been in this struggle long before COVID-19. We've proven that we can do things quickly when we need to. So let's again, put our minds and do better at listening to what the community wants and do it not just during a pandemic, but every single day. And I'll end on that point and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Wow, Kelsey, powerful, powerful presentation. And I actually didn't know that that street had been paved over and that's, that is really upsetting uh, and disheartening to, to hear. Um, we do have one question that's come in so far uh, from Janet. Janet says, hi, you may speak about this anyway, but is there any talk of closing off Lower Water Street to traffic? And uh, so, to traffic and use only for pedestrian and bike use. 
Yeah, so Lower Water Street, um, I, I think it's going to happen, to be honest. There's, a, there's already a bike lane there, but it wasn't part of what the permanent rollout was going to be. Um, but I'm hopeful that because of the proximity to the waterfront and we know how well that boardwalk has been used, that um, we'll recognize that as a really essential street to, to close down and, and close down the cars and open up the people. Um, but no, nothing guaranteed yet. She gives a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, great. I know that's not very helpful, but uh, again, it's iterative, so nothing is really off the table. We've got um, another question, Kelsey. Um, yeah. Paul says, why do we not repaint intersections and areas on our roads again after the paving fiasco? So why don't we repaint the, is it the Creighton Street that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, it's not specified, but yeah, that's, uh, what, could we repaint them afterwards? Is that something that's on the table? Is there a reason I mean, why we don't? Yeah, I think that's something that, that that's really, um, we have to ask the community, I, and I definitely don't attest to speak for them or, or, what, that, or what that experience was like for them to, to have their efforts paved over. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I, think there's, I think that would help, but it doesn't, it doesn't recognize the solution that's needed. So I think, you know, for me, that traffic circle was uh, a piece of infrastructure. It was like a cry. It was a cry for help. It was a beautiful um, initiative, but just simply giving somebody the money or, or, or paying one artist to, to redo it is, is not going to solve the more systemic issues that we have in terms of where infrastructure goes and what we're prioritizing. I would say again that um, this, these three projects were so amazing because if you were around in the community during the time they were painting them, there was people coming out from all over the streets. It wasn't just one artist doing it. It was tons of people coming out, participating, engaging, like it really was a community event. And so um, again, it, it has to be more than just putting back what was there. We have to do so much, so much more. We have to do so much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there, is there anything, um, like, what are some other creative ways that you've seen that maybe haven't been mentioned yet to make streets safer? Yeah, I mean, um, and I, I guess I'm going to preface this with, like, every, every street is different, and, and community really, in my mind, they, they own the street. They're, they're agents of the street, it's their community, it's their neighborhood, so what, what might work for one place might not work for the other, and, and um, but I would say in Portland, they've had some really interesting uh, examples. I've seen a slink. So you can create almost like a mini roundabout in the middle of intersections. It's quite small, but you put an intervention in the middle of an intersection so that people have to kind of, they have to slow down because there's a physical barrier. They can't zoom just through. And they have like little community gardens there or, um, yeah, I've seen like a, a, a pogo stick rally in the middle of, of this like, little, little street. I think those are really cool. Um, we've had some interesting ideas here in Halifax. I mean, the 3D crosswalk uh, fiasco that happened um, was a really cool, at the base of it, it was a really cool initiative. It's not, it wasn't allowed legally, but we have to, we have to open up the rules so that we can be more creative. And I think, as you've seen with the traffic circle, um, what makes our streets safe also makes our streets more beautiful. And so our challenge is what are those things that, that we want to implement that will um, reflect the beauty of our community and also help make it safer. I think I also mentioned that Halifax Cycling Coalition put in those bike corrals that you see on Spring Garden Road and Dr. Loney and they had Mi'kmaq artists um, kind of display their artwork on those corrals as well that so served as bike parking but also prevented people from parking in a spot that would block the view of the intersection. So those are also some creative examples. Great idea. Thank you so much for that, Kelsey. Um, Charlotte is wondering, um, well, Charlotte says, creating more walking uh, and biking streets seems great from an ecological point of view, but wouldn't it force people in cars to drive around twice as long looking for parking? It's an interesting point. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, not necessarily. I think, I think the whole point of it is that you wouldn't drive in the first place, that um, you would leave the car at home and particularly in these neighborhoods uh, that they're implementing these streets in a lot of the amenities and services are within a walkable distance so um, instead of taking that 10 minutes to drive around and look for a parking just just leave the car at home and and walk and walk down the street um, 
with your children or, or you know, <laughs> eat, drinking a coffee or, or having an ice cream or whatever it is that you like to do and, and enjoy that public realm. I think that's the main point of it. But I would say too, like if it does, you know, you can still access those streets. It's not that difficult to access the streets, but um, it's more about recognizing that there's going to be other people using them in a different way. So the streets aren't necessarily closed. It's just saying, you know, when you're in this street, it's not just a space for cars. There's also going to be people walking and rolling and using it for different purposes. So yeah, from a GHG perspective, it's, it's not that significant. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, maybe saying uh, as well, Paul brought this up, uh, is the need to address city council about these issues as well and just showing up for presentation and the, the power, the strength of numbers, which as a member-based organization, you know, we totally get. Yeah, and I think that's twofold, right? I think, I think that we, again, in this moment, us, the people that have the privilege and the ability to go to council at one o'clock, it's important for them to show up. But I think there's also a role on council to go and meet the people where they're at and figure out what it is that the community is actually thinking and what it is they need, recognizing that not everyone has, has the time, the privilege or the capacity to engage in the way the current um, public participation process is set up. All right, we're, uh, I might just say um, we're at two o'clock now. We do have a couple last minute comments, which I'd like to get in. So this is, this is the firing round. <laughs> so uh, Johanna says, any discussion about wheelchair stigma? A lot of times seniors want to be close to shopping, et cetera, thus cars. But if cool wheels for seniors to sit in and be driven or possibly drive, if can do by themselves, seniors can drive but not walk far, but if these wheels could help. Uh, so maybe if you want to talk about the wheelchair stigma and making that more accessible, uh, making the streets more accessible for the elderly as well. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. And so accessibility needs and, and accessibility parking, when I mentioned the IMP and what their priorities are, the that's at the top of the pyramid. So above everything else, accessibility is, is the issue uh, that takes priority over even walking or biking or all of those other modes. And I think that, that that's important to be at the pop, top of the pyramid, obviously, so people can access and, and participate in, in the city. Um, but also is that if we have less cars on the road, so if you don't need if you don't need the car to get around and you can walk and you can bike, then you leave more space for the people that actually need those parking spots and actually need to be within um, within that distance uh, of the of the services. There's just on the initiative of, of elderly folks and, and how they get around, again, uh, lots of elderly folks can't drive or, or don't want to drive. And there's a really cool um, initiative that's happening in Calgary and BC right now where it's like a, um, volunteers are taking out a bike that, that the uh, elderly folks sit in the back and they get to be biked around the city and go to all the shops and things like that. So they get to experience the street uh, from, from the back of a bike and um, it's, it's really neat. They, they really enjoy the fresh air and, and seeing the street through a different perspective. Amazing. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, really wonderful presentation, very engaging, uh, and it's great to see everybody uh, participating, so please keep that up. Um, Charlotte, I've seen your comments as well, and uh, what I will do is I'll connect you with Kelsey uh, after this presentation. Um, but I think in the interest of time, uh, we will move along. We're getting into webinar three of four or presentation three of four. And so if you're just joining us now, then welcome. Uh, my name is Dana and I'm your host for today's Adaptive Actions webinar with the Ecology Action Center. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce everybody here to our next presenter, Amy Gasparetto. Amy is EAC's Senior Coordinator, Community Food. And she's with us today to discuss how EAC is working with the Halifax Regional Municipality and others to address food issues across the region and apply our learnings to build a better food future for the HRM. Uh, get ready for a pun. I'm hungry for more information. 
uh, on this, Amy. So uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, Dana. That was a good one. Oh, already. Am. Sorry, already. Here we go. Oh boy, sorry. Um, I'll be right there. There's always got to be at least one technical. Always, right? I know. Okay, <laughs> here we go. I'm going to just turn off my camera here, but I want you to see my full screen. Great. Uh, so thanks for the introduction, Dana, uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about the sort of state of food security um, in Nova Scotia. And my talk today is really going to focus on how um, we at EAC have been working with the Halifax Regional Municipality. Our, our work in food extends much beyond uh, Halifax, but Amy, that's sort of what I'm going to focus on today. Amy, I might just interject and say we still can't see your screen. It just says your name there. Oh boy, <laughs> sorry. This is still relatively new for us and uh, this is, so I'm glad that I'm not in your position, Amy. I just have to host. <laughs> yeah, I um, have done this before, but apparently, so can you see my screen now? Oh yes, yeah, we see your screen now. Thanks so much for that. Wonderful, thanks. Okay. So uh, we know that food security has been a big issue before COVID-19, um, yet the pandemic seems to really have shone a new light on some of the major vulnerabilities that exist in our food system. And that's at every part of the cycle. So from food production to food access, it's also really heightened both the impact and the urgency of this issue. Um, in many ways, the pandemic has been a call to action, um, both to sort of support our food, our farmers and our food workers, but also the more than 4 million Canadians who aren't able to get enough food on the table. So this is very much a social justice issue, um, but it is also an environmental issue in the sense that the egg sector is responsible for 12% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so you know, there's a real sort of shift that needs to happen in how we look at agricultural production as an avenue to um, supporting climate change mitigation and adaptation. One of the big things that we've been seeing and responding to in the Halifax Regional Municipality is issues around food access. Um, so these issues have been significantly heightened with things like increased isolation, job losses, um, and sort of just general limitations in our ability to move around. Um, and what I will say is that food security is an issue that is absolutely disproportionately felt among certain communities. And though in, those communities are low income communities, racialized communities, the um, folks across the region that uh, are, have been systemically marginalized. Um, so some of the good news sort of around this is that people sort of from grassroots also to government are really mobilizing to tackle the food access issues at this time um, and really coming together in ways to meet the growing demand of families who, who are struggling to put good food on the table. The mobile food market has been one of those actors. Uh, and for those of you who aren't aware, the EAC has played an integral role in the development of the mobile food market since its inception in 2015. Uh, it's essentially a fresh food market on wheels. Um, we started with a pilot uh, serving five communities and it's since expanded to 13 across the region. And we do this work with other partners, including the Halifax Regional Municipality, Nova Scotia Health Authority, and MetroWorks Employment Association. So the grounds have really shifted in the face of COVID-19. Um, and like many other food access initiatives across the region, it's sort of presented a tough reality in terms of forcing the closure of public markets, um, while also knowing that our services are, are needed more than ever. Since March 23rd, our markets have been closed to the public, but we've pivoted to provide emergency food support. Um, and so what this looks like is our food, we've shifted from low cost food to free food, and that's been supported through various 
provincial and federal grants that we've been able to access. Um, we've expanded our partner sites um, to those that still have staffing to be able to sort of receive pack and get the food out to people who need it most. Um, we've been working a lot more closely with public health uh, to de develop sort of like safe operating protocols around food distribution, food aggregation, and really been working with others in the food community to share those so that people can sort of keep their services up and running. Um, and we've been working with the municipality and others to almost prioritize food distribution. Um, and that's sort of based on working with community developers, organizational, organizational staff to understand what it is that's going on community. Because what I will say is that it's, it's virtually impossible sometimes to find the people that are, that are suffering the most. Um, isolated seniors, uh, people living alone. Um, so we're really relying on community members to um, help us find those people. Um, we've continued to work with our main supplier. Superstore is a supplier. We also work with Stone Hearth Bakery and as many uh, local farmers as possible. Um, and we've been really just working to make sure that the boxes include a variety of health, healthy and as much local food as we can. Um, we've received grants to, to uh, add Superstore gift cards to these food boxes and sort of have worked with public health to develop general health information and resources that um, community has sort of asked us about and um, requested that we include in, in the boxes. The municipality has played a very big role in the emergency food efforts to date um, and also is demonstrating great interest in playing an integral role in recovery phase as we move out of emergency food distribution. So municipal staff from various departments have been redeployed. Um, we've got ongoing contributions from planning and development staff, from HRM search and rescue volunteers, um, their youth lives, uh, staff have been helping us get food out and HRM has also helped us with space and vehicles to pack and distribute food and um, are also continuing on commitments that were made private prior to COVID-19. So we had worked out um, a one-time contribution of $75,000 for a truck so that the mobile food market could expand vehicles, move down to the eastern shore and um, really build the capacity to get more food out the door. Since March 23rd, we've delivered more than 600 emergency food boxes across nine communities, um, 34,000 pounds of food. We've collaborated with many, many different community groups to get this food out the door and um, two and a half thousand produce packs, which are essentially, you know, a week supply of vegetables for a household of four. And it really has been a colossal effort, which, which certainly would not have been possible without staff from HRM, as well as um, different community organizations that we've been building relationships with over time. What I will also say is that the mobile food market is not alone in, in this work. Uh, countless groups across, or uh, countless groups and organizations across the municipality have been pivoting their activities to respond to the needs around food. And it's, demonstrating um, both the need and impact for the physical and social infrastructure required to move food around the province, particularly to those who need it most. So I think it was Kelsey who spoke on this a little bit. While we absolutely need the physical infrastructure both in communities um, to distribute food at a local level, we also need the sort of social infrastructure that activates the physical and so it's the people the networks the relationships i spoke to a colleague at dartmouth north and i said you know how are you finding people and she said we're we're using phone trees to figure out who needs who has the greatest food needs right now so it's it's understanding that um, the network of individuals and organizations and food networks are absolutely essential to making sure that that uh, those physical spaces are animated um, and, you know, the, it's sort of reinforcing what we already know about our local food system, which is that we need shorter supply chains, we need to keep investing in the physical and social infra infrastructure, 
and also focus on the supportive policy environments. Um, you know, income is the number one predictor of health. And so we can't talk about food security without talking about uh, income and other social supports. So as mentioned, um, the pandemic has really exposed new opportunities for the municipality and their role in food, uh, which we're, we're helping as best we can to shape through our partnership with them. So throughout the pandemic, they've kind of identified four key priorities. They've focused on food distribution access through their work with the mobile food market. Um, They've been focusing on growing food at home and in community spaces. So um, some staff are working to get seeds and food growing kits out the door through community organizations. And they're also working on um, like a centralized portal for identifying and sharing different supports that uh, individuals and organizations can access related to food. Um, and what I would say about these things is they're, while very important, they're not sort of connected. It isn't like a holistic approach. And so that's sort of what takes us to the HRM Food Action Plan, which um, is something that we initiated with the Halifax Regional Municipality prior to COVID-19 and is something that it now has a sort of re-emphasis of its importance. Um, and so food security has been identified as, a, as an important component of HRM's economic recovery plan and a pillar of their social policy framework. Um, and because of that, they have a renewed commitment to work with the Halifax Food Policy Alliance on the development of this regional food action plan. So the HRM Food Action Plan was approved by Regional Council in December 2019. Um, and the idea is that this will be co-led by Halifax and the Halifax Food Policy Alliance. And work is currently underway to develop a framework and an engagement plan for Council's consideration in early fall. And what I will say about this plan um, is that we are emphasizing the importance of the governance structure that is going to sort of support this plan. So food action plans and strategies are um, instruments that have been implemented in cities across North America, and they are always attached to some form of collaborative food governance structure. So it is a food policy council or a coalition um, that comes together to sort of merge community business and government interests around uh, food, which is essentially a public good. So for those of you less familiar um, with the Halifax Food Policy Alliance, it was formed in 2013 as a partnership of organizations representing different sectors related to the food system. Um, and EAC has played an integral role in the establishment of HFPA and continues to serve as a co-chair today. So we do that alongside Nova Scotia Health Authority Public Health. Um, and at the time that HFPA emerged, there was a, a real recognition that while momentum continues to build around food security work, a lot more uh, is needed. And specifically, we needed better coordination among actors, stronger ties to local government, and more direct links between issues on the ground um, that different communities are experiencing and the policy changes uh, that are being implemented to address them. So like I said, um, food strategies have been adopted in, in many sort of cities across Canada and North America and we have a lot of models to be building this on. Generally a food action plan initiates from a food charter which is essentially a vision or a future state for the food system. Um, it's it's uh, sort of a call to action um, for many groups to come around the table and play an active role in creating a more regionalized, healthy, just and sustainable food system. It is always accompanied by, you know, the plan, which brings the food charter to life. So the plan is really a coordinated plan of action for a region that identifies clear roles and responsibilities for community government and business. Um, it will include short, medium, long-term actions, as well as like a, a, an evaluation framework to be able to understand, you know, progress we're making around food. Um, and again, in order to be effective, it assumes the establishment of a local governance structure that um, supports 
a diverse array of voices being at the table to direct the programs and policies that are supporting and advancing food security. Um, so it will build opportun opportunities for coordinated action. Um, similar to what Kelsey was saying, I mean, I think there's a traditional idea of what engagement means, not only in HRM, but in, in many different regions. And so that's one thing we're really focused on right now, particularly in the time of COVID-19, where in-person gatherings and meetings are going to be less possible. Um, we're trying to think about the most creative ways that we can get out into the community and talk to people about their food experiences. Um, because what's most important about this kind of plan is that people are placed at the heart of the food system where self-determination around food um, and the notion of choice uh, being able to choose how you purchase your food, where you purchase your food, the kind of food options that are available to you are all sort of foundational components of, of this plan. And the other thing is that um, one of the things that I like to talk about with the mobile food market is like, yes, it's a traveling fresh food market on wheels, but what's interesting about it is that we have mobilized so many resources, including you know, HRM's vehicles, buses, buildings. So the question I'm often asking is like, how are we using public infrastructure, um, spaces, vehicles in creative ways to serve social and environmental outcomes? And, you know, the main question I would say that we're all sort of asking ourselves in the food world is, uh, we have responded very quickly to meet some emergency needs. And it's great that we, have been able to do that. It it shows that it's possible when we when we want to make that kind of change. And so the question I sort of continue to ask myself and leave others with is is how is it that can that these short term responses can lead to longer term food systems transformation? Do, do, do. And that is it. I'm going to put my camera back on. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. It's a lot of uh, food for thought. Pun again. To Totally intended. <laughs> and um, I'm wondering, does anybody have any questions for Amy? I'm wondering, um, you know, do you think that when we get to the other side of COVID-19, do you think our, our food system is going to continue to look different? Do you think there'll be anything, or is there anything maybe that you would like to see that will have changed per Permanently as a result of this. And I might just say to your, uh, your screen is still showing the zoom right now. I'm, I'm so sorry. For all <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think every decision that we make from here on in is going to impact the future of how these systems look, whether it's public transportation or, or our food systems. So when we talk about uh, the economic recovery plan and stimulus packages. It's like, A, what are the things that we are prioritizing and choosing to invest money in, i.e. allocate budgets? Um, and then who is at the table when those decisions are being made? Um, and if community can't be at directly at that table, then how it is, how is it that we're working to engage diverse communities in that decision making process. So I absolutely think it's possible. Um, I think the shift is going to have to happen on two ends of the spectrum. One is looking at our production and figuring out how it is we shorten supply chains, how to really strengthen um, local food production via policy, via infrastructure, um, and really helping our, our farmers with the kinds of supports that they need. And on the flip side of that, it's looking at food access issues in communities. Um, again, building the physical infrastructure as well as the, the social networks that are really needed to, to animate um, those spaces. Mm -hmm. Something that I've heard, maybe you could speak to a little bit more, I have heard that local farmers are particularly busy this year with uh, food boxes like CSA boxes, community supported agriculture, and that um, more people this year seem to be interested in buying local. Is that something that you've heard as well? 
I don't know if it's this year. It's certainly since um, the onset of COVID-19. And I, I mean, the reasons for that could be many, but some of the primary reasons would be that A, people haven't really been able to leave their homes. And so the way in which we access food is changing. Um, some people don't want to go to the grocery store during this time. And so they're looking for alternative options. It's a good time to start exploring. Um, organizations like Farmers Markets of Nova Scotia have been working night and day to get a lot more um, food box programs, food delivery programs, and farmers market services online. So the sort of like overnight, we've seen technological advances in terms of ordering systems, uh, how easy it is to, to go online and order things. So all of those kinds of changes have certainly facilitated more people using these services. Um, the question remains whether or not that increased usage will continue, you know, beyond COVID-19 when things sort of have the potential to go back to normal. Um, it, it's a question, but for sure, more people are starting to, to look at food box programs and almost home delivery services of food. Yeah. Okay, well, Amy, thank you so much. Uh, it's so great to hear about this. And um, I hadn't really, I, I was not, I did not have my finger on the pulse uh, <laughs> as much as you did. So it was so great to learn from you and to get an update on uh, everything going on in the food world. Learned a lot. <laughs> Um, thank you again uh, to everybody who's participating today as well as um, a listener who's, uh, you know, maybe inside trying to stay cool or outside working on their tan uh, as we are all talking today uh, together in our uh, Adaptive Actions webinar. Um, we have one final webinar today. Uh, and before we get into that, uh, I would like to remind folks that uh, if you are enjoying what you are hearing today from us, it is only because of the support of our community, our members, uh, over 5,000 individuals who support the Ecology Action Center, either with a small monthly donation or an annual donation, um, that we're able to demonstrate the level of resilience that uh, we have today in this strange time and I'm so grateful to have met so many of you and um, to have you joining us today as a part of our community. Thank you. If you haven't joined us as a member yet, of course it's not too late. Now time like the present, right? Uh, you can come uh, join us and join our community. We will provide a link for you uh, in the chat below. And uh, it would be wonderful to have you as a member. Uh, for those of you who have attended one of our webinars in the past, uh, you've likely already met our next presenter, uh, our Wilderness Outreach Coordinator, Karen McKendry. Uh, if you have met her, you know that she is just passionate about engaging individuals with nature. And so it's quite fitting today that her presentation uh, will focus on getting that vitamin N, which stands for nature, uh, as she shares fascinating findings uh, on how your time outdoors is changing your body and your mind, both of which are for the better. So welcome, Karen. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for that fun introduction. And thank you to all my colleagues who presented before me who I'm already inspired by every day at work at EAC, but to hear these great synopses of how they've been adapting lately and how community partners and government are receiving that has been extra encouraging. So I'm so lucky to work with you guys. Um, I'm gonna share my presentation now. So yeah, Dan was right. This is a subject I'm very passionate about and sort of on the side. And um, I've gotten to uh, explore a little bit more lately. So I uh, am lucky that I get to work at EAC on how we impact nature and how we could do a better job of that through uh, more protected areas or how we manage natural resources. But lately, I've been getting a lot of emails and other forms of contact about how people are impacted by nature, how it helps them, 
but also how difficult it's been to be restricted in their access to nature, like through parks and trails, uh, because of the pandemic restrictions. And so today I'm going to share with you some tidbits about what these people are onto. The research that shows that um, time in nature has really profound and widespread uh, health benefits. So a, a big call to action for me, sort of outside of working in my personal life, uh, was this uh, fantastic book that came out in 2005 uh, called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Liu. So it was really great. The, well, the way it was written, it really brought a lot of elements together of an emerging uh, crisis, which is this widening gap between children and nature, especially in the younger generations. And the book showed the potential sources of this separation and the consequences of it. And it really sparked a movement at first in the US, but then that spread to Canada and beyond to call people to work um, in a variety of ways to reconnect children with the natural world uh, because of a, a term that Richard Lou coined called nature deficit disorder, which people can sort of intuitively get. Uh, so this is a non-official condition, but it does uh, provide a synopsis of this alienation that people are feeling from nature. Uh, and he talks about the costs that are seen both in individuals, but also at higher levels of organization. So they can be seen in communities and in cities as well. So we need to cure this disorder. And he says, for so many reasons, not only is it in our self-interest in several ways to, to cure this disorder, but also the health of our earth is at stake. But it's now been 15 years since that great synopsis. So I want to share with you some more of what we've been learning um, and that Louvre has written a second book that has a shorthand or a quick fix for what ails us. So what is the cure for nature deficit disorder? Well, appropriately, it's vitamin N, which is time in nature. So if your doctor isn't already prescribing you vitamin N, they should be. So the first aspect uh, that's been proven about how your health is positively impacted by time in nature is your cardiovascular health. So you already know this kind of stuff already generally is that you know physical activity gets your heart pumping which is one of the factors of reducing your risk of coronary heart disease which is now the number two leading cause of death in canada for adults activities like hiking in nature are an excellent form of exercise and they have relatively low impact on the joints they help you reduce your risk of heart disease but also other heart related problems like hypertension type 2 diabetes and obesity the risk of osteoporosis and arthritis are also reduced by hiking, but if you already have them, they can be partially treated by getting out onto the trails. But you might think, well, why don't I just walk on a treadmill or at the mall and avoid all of the black flies and scratches and sunburns and dog poop that you might encounter on a hike? Well, interestingly, more recent scientific studies are showing that hiking in nature is way better for you than a trip to the gym. And here's how. So physical exercise anywhere is going to help you with your cardiovascular health, but being active in nature benefits other physiological systems as well. So one aspect of your health that's helped by time in nature is your physical and emotional responses to stress. So the much heralded stress reduction abilities of your time in nature, of the time, spending time in nature, uh, are true. So tr stress is killing us, uh, but more than 100 peer-reviewed studies have now found that one of the main benefits of spending time in nature is stress reduction. So how do scientists measure stress reduction? Well, one way is they look at formal stress-related disorders like anxiety and depression. And they find fewer incidences of these disorders when people have more access to nature right outside their homes. And in children, this protective impact of nature nearby is more beneficial for the most vulnerable children. So those experiencing the highest level of stress uh, benefit the most from being in nature. Uh, scientists are also measuring the physiological responses to stress in people. So there's a large body of evidence that shows that people with chronologically or chronically high blood pressure and cortisol levels, which are caused by stress, are more prone to heart disease, but also metabolic diseases, dementia, and depression. So in Japan, where there's actually a word for death by overworking, and stress is a very serious health problem, Stressed Japanese businessmen are often prescribed time in nature, called forest bathing. At some of Japan's forest therapy trails, hikers have their blood pressure and cortisol levels measured before and after their hike. Blood pressure and cortisol respond to stress both in a short time frame, but also under a longer time frame. 
So even after a short 15 minute walk on a forest bathing trail, hikers have a 12% decrease in cortisol levels and a 1.4% decrease in blood pressure, which is remarkable for a short period of time. But returning hikers also reported that over the long term, they experience better moods and lower anxiety, which are signs of recovering from chronic stress. Repeated time in nature has a long-term positive effect. Going for walks in an urban setting did not produce the same effects, so it's not just the walking. So what is it then? Well, research in Japan is pointing to chemicals released by trees and by soil that have a positive effect on the human body. One study put two groups of people in hotel rooms for three nights. In one treatment group, during the night, the researchers wafted in vaporized oil from Hinoki cypress trees, one of the tree species that's thought to be beneficial to people on the forest bathing trails. In the other treatment group, nothing was added to the air in their rooms. The participants breathing in the cypress oil for three nights had significantly higher levels of NK cells in their bloodstream. This is an immune system cell type that works to protect us from disease, including killing cancer cells. So being among the trees literally calms you down and gives you an immune boost. Another specific condition that might be helped by time in nature is ADHD in children. So one of perhaps the most striking findings in child psychology in the last two decades relates to a mysteriously increasing mental disorder, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. So children with this disorder are often restless and chronically have difficulty paying attention, following directions and staying on task. There are adults with ADHD as well. And the symptoms of ADHD create serious challenges for people in their home lives, in their social life and at school. It's estimated that more than 1 million people in Canada are impacted by this disorder, most of them children. In some cases, medications like Ritalin can effectively control some symptoms of the disorder, but there's evidence that Ritalin and other medications are being overprescribed and that complementary treatments are underexplored like time in nature. A growing body of research is showing that time in nature is an excellent form of therapy for children with ADHD sometimes able to replace medication or behavioral therapy for affected individuals. In one study, children with ADHD were better able to concentrate using a standardized test after just a 20 minute walk in nature. The effect was more substantial than using a common ADHD controlling medication and the positive effects were not seen in children after they walked in a downtown area. A national study in the US found that parents of children with ADHD reported that after school and weekend activities that are in green settings, like hiking or playing outside, had a more soothing effect on their children than activities in a non-green setting, like reading indoors. This green advantage held true across age, gender, income level, and geographic region. Your cognitive health matters too. How time in nature might help folks with ADHD and the rest of us may lie in how our bodies switch attention systems while they're in nature. We have two forms of attention. One form is called directed or active attention. So this is what you use to focus on a task, such as doing your taxes or paying attention to this talk. So having this ability to focus your attention on command is, is vital for learning and for survival. But we can experience what scientists now call directed attention fatigue. So paying attention is hard. And switching our attention from a conversation to a text to a grocery list and then onto something else will literally tires out our active attention. Symptoms of directed attention fatigue include impulsive behavior, irritation, and inability to concentrate. Any of that sound familiar? Our other attention system, our involuntary or reflex attention, is alerted when something grabs your attention, like a surprise sound or a sudden movement or a remarkable sight. Both symptoms can't grab, both systems can't grab our attention at the same time. So the wonderful thing that happens in nature is that our involuntary attention takes over in such a fascinating environment and it turns off our directed attention. So environmental psychologists have started calling this the restorative environment, taking a break from overthinking things and just realizing the world around you not only gives your active attention a much needed break, it actually recharges it. One study found a group of backpackers returning from a three day wilderness trip had better proofreading performance than a group of people returning from a three day urban vacation. 
Another study had a group of participants do a task that was designed to exhaust their directed attention. And then one group went for a 40 minute walk in nature, while another group sat quietly for 40 minutes. Once back on the tasks, the nature walkers performed better than those who had only rested. And the nature walkers also reported a more positive emotion and less anger. So spending time outdoors recharges your brain in such a way that you actually perform better indoors afterwards. There's another part of our brain that gets renewed in the outdoors and it can sometimes get short shrift and that's the creative part of our minds. So the creative aspect of our minds is important even for those of us who don't work as artists or in the creative field. Being creative uses distinct parts of your brain and activity in these areas can be measured using scans or on standardized tests. So one study tested 56 outward bound participants before and after a four day wilderness hike. After their big adventure, participants showed a 50% improvement in creativity on a standardized test. Now, there were other factors that likely affected their creativity, and there are researchers now pursuing more studies to try to tease these apart. It could be that time in nature allows our minds to wander and our imagination to be stimulated. So our imagination network can be monitored, as was done in a study in Edinburgh, Scotland. So researchers monitored people's brains using a portable EEG device, which they wore while walking through three zones, a shopping district, a path through a green space, and a busy commercial district. The results showed a higher activity in the part of the brain that's used in meditation while in the green space. This study and others have found that when people are relaxed in nature, they can enter a sort of state of soft fascination. Their brains are generally occupied by nature's sights and sounds. At this time, the imagination network turns on. This is the part of the brain that allows memories and ideas and emotions to intermingle. When this network is active, we're better able to imagine future scenarios and reconsider recent events to gain a better perspective on our lives. We can have that aha moment or make better meaning out of recent happenings. A better perspective can be a lifesaver, literally, which brings me to my next area of health mental health. Mental health benefits of time and nature have been talked about a lot, including in the mainstream media in recent years. But the study of nature's effects on the brain, called eco-psychology, has actually been around since the early 1990s. Or maybe earlier, since people have recommended time and nature to soothe mental health challenges since, since perhaps the dawn of our separation from the wilder world. One of the greatest mental health challenges of our time is depression. Currently, levels of depression are on the increase in Canada among both adults and children. One in four people in Canada may experience substantial enough depression to need treatment at least once in their lifetime. One of the forms of treatment for depression that is showing promise is time in nature, also now called ecotherapy. Longer periods of time in nature, such as multi-day treks, have shown benefits to mental health for decades now. In the US, programs like Outward Bound and the like have successfully helped teens with mild to more substantial mental health challenges improve their mental health with long-term results. These times in nature are also preventative by helping groups like at-risk teens improve their abilities to cope with mental health challenges as they come up later in life. These more intense forms of time in nature to work on mental health challenges uh, called adventure therapy have also been successful in helping people with PTSD substance abuse and suicidal thoughts. Multi-day intentionally planned wilderness treatment programs are transformational for participants. The processes that work in our brains during outdoor adventures in nature is not fully understood. Some research has found that while people are in nature, they have a lower level activity in their prefrontal cortex part of the brain. That's the area that among other things generates like repetitive thoughts and negative emotions. We get a break from our obsessive selves when we're in the wild. Although adventure therapy is emerging as a promising form of psychological therapy, less ambitious ecotherapies are also proving useful. In one study, hiking in nature for just 90 minutes reduced prefrontal cortex activity, unlike hiking in an urban environment. Mental health benefits are seen in a variety of green spaces from deep wilderness to city parks, to grasslands, to even working in gardens. Physical activity in any of these green spaces all seem to reduce stress and enhance mood relative to time spent in urban contexts. 
And spending time in nature with other humans is even better for our mental health. A large scale study in England of their Walking for Health program found that people experienced many health benefits from walking outdoors in groups, including decreased perceived stress and depression, but it was actually people who had recently experienced stressful life events like a serious illness, death of a loved one or marital separation that especially seem to see a mood boost after walking outdoors in groups. So when life throws you a big curveball, one of the best things you can do for yourself and others is go for a long walk in nature with other people. Hippocrates advice from over 2000 years ago is perhaps more true than ever. Walking is man's best medicine. Another understudy but fascinating aspect of the benefits of time in nature is the spiritual benefits. So the natural world has an uncanny ability to provide transcendental experiences to people of all ages across all cultures and religions. Even children have the capacity to have deeply moving spiritual experiences in nature, even before they're exposed to religion and even without extensive vocabulary to describe those experiences. A growing body of researchers who have examined the spiritual life of children have found that children describe visionary episodes, dreamlike experiences, or moments of bliss, and that these experiences most often occur in nature. In a 2014 study published in the Journal of the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture, researchers found that of the 10 children they studied that spent five to 10 hours per week in nature, those children said they felt a spiritual connection to the earth and they felt their role in protecting it. Children in the study who engaged in regular free play outside also expressed a deep appreciation for beauty and reported both feeling awestruck by nature, but also feeling happy about their sense of belonging in the natural world. Parents of the children who had the highest affinity for nature were parents who described spending a significant amount of time in nature during their childhoods. These childhood transcendental experiences can be important in adulthood. Many famous leaders describe spiritual moments in nature as children as their sources of awe and inspiration. Joan of Arc, Jane Goodall, John Muir, T.S. Eliot, E.O. Wilson, and Thomas Edison have all described times in nature during their childhood that were wondrous and were pivotal to the adults that they became. But the regular Joe can have profound moments in nature too. Nature heals what ails us, it soothes our soul, and it connects us to something larger than ourselves. So how much time should you spend in nature to reap these health benefits? What dose of vitamin N should you take? Should you make it a priority to fit time in with nature? Amazingly, there are people researching how much is the minimum amount of time out in nature to receive these health benefits. Research in Finland has demonstrated positive effects on health and mood from just 15 minutes of sitting in nature per day, while another study attributed health gains to at least five hours per month. Many studies have indicated that longer is better, but not everyone can manage a five-day wilderness trek. But maybe we can piece something together. At least one author has suggested a food pyramid-like approach. How you put your menu together is up to you. What studies are suggesting is at least 15 to 45 minutes a day, a few times per week. 15 minutes seems to be the minimum time needed to receive a calming effect from being in nature, and 45 is the minimum to receive cognitive benefits and feelings of increased vitality. Five to 10 hours per month spent in smaller or larger chunks lets you go deeper into the health benefits. And longer getaways are wonderful. So it's inescapable. Several days of disconnecting from society and responsibilities, now sometimes called unplugging, is very good for you. Many people have directly experienced this during a two to three night camping trip or even a weekend in the valley. Making space for longer semi-regular getaways in nature, whatever your budget, is worth it. So there's now a substantial body of research and firsthand experiences that demonstrate the myriad health benefits of being active in nature. Spending time in nature can be a relatively safe and low cost way to access these benefits for the prevention and treatment of disease and for better quality of life. Even access to nearby nature like city parks and community gardens has demonstrable health benefits. Proximity to nature should almost be a human right. People who access nature regularly, which is easier the closer they are to it, are healthier. But this can be a challenge for parts of societies that have barriers to access. 
One study in the UK found that people living in more deprived communities had lower levels of stress if they had more green space in their neighborhoods. Another study found that 26% of England's black and other minority ethnic populations visit natural environments less than three times a year. Some of the people who stand to benefit the most from time in nature face the greatest barriers to get into it. What communities here in Nova Scotia face barriers to accessing nature? Here in Nova Scotia, could we examine access to nature by neighborhood, by income level, or by ethnicity? What could we do to work on equitable access to nature? Another barrier to accessing nature is literally the barriers that were put up around parks during the early COVID-19 restrictions. What happens to people when you stop them from going to their favorite park or trail, especially during a very stressful time in their lives? There are already several surveys going around about how restrictions impacted people's access to nature or recreation. This global experiment has so much to teach us, including through the varied responses of park managers. For example, in Vancouver, the city of Vancouver modified use of trails in Stanley Park. They closed the park's roads to cars and shifted cyclists there, leaving their seawall sea trail for pedestrians only. The park then used park champions to remind people of social distancing rules. They did not close their parks. Vancouver Park Board's general manager, Malcolm Bromley said, the city's parks and beaches remain open and we recognize the important role they play in overall health. We choose not to just shut things down and go the enforcement route. We decided to take an incremental, thoughtful approach. Several cities have found creative ways to allow park use, but remind park goers of the two meter rule. So here you can see a city in Portland that mowed circles in the grass two meters apart in a popular park, and other parks have painted circles on their grass. Parks are helping people to reconnect with park wildlife through things like webcams, like the city of Vancouver's Heron Cam in Stanley Park. And in Victoria, not only have parks always remained open during the pandemic, parks have pivoted to help respond to the pandemic. So park resources that are usually used for hanging baskets in Victoria are being somewhat reduced this year and that money is being redirected instead for park staff to grow food plants, to give away free to residents, and then create live streaming videos for new gardeners. The City of Victoria, in partnership with their health authority, also opened three temporary outdoor homeless shelters in their parks. Victoria Mayor Lisa Helps said, these are extraordinary times and they do call for extraordinary measures. I'm glad to see that parks can help save the day in emergency situations, including through the health infrastructure that they provide. My hope is that there will be a post COVID-19 analysis of how closures of parks and trails affected all sorts of things, including people's health so that decision makers can make better informed uh, choices the next time a pandemic comes around. Access to nature is such a low cost, widely available resource for health. It's time we took it more seriously in our planning for public health. I guess my main message to you as an individual today is that this, you are onto something. Every time you have an inkling that you made the right choice when you spontaneously decide to go outside, you were right. Planning to spend time in nature is a wise, cost-effective way to improve and maintain your health. Time outdoors is not frivolous or lazy. It's an investment in your whole being. I encourage you to feel that prioritizing time in nature, alone or with others, is a smart move. And I sincerely hope that now, as the pandemic restrictions are on access to nature are being reduced, that you're able to get back to nourishing yourself in an ancient way that now has modern insights into its value. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Karen. I'm glad that you were the last presentation of the day today because you have inspired me to go out for a walk <laughs> very shortly. Um, but of course, before I run off and do that, there uh, is a question um, from the audience. So Paul, uh, first of all, Paul had brought up throughout your presentation that there was some research that was done with Indigenous people uh, showing the same positive results about being outside in nature. 
and um, also that the Council of Outdoor Educators of Ontario has researched uh, this area and produced a document about 30 years ago that's still available today. So that's, that's interesting. Um, his question was, this has huge implications for urban or suburban design school teachings. Many cities that have great access to outdoor facilities and that make more sense than what we could commonly do. Is common sense so common? <laughs> that's, that's a broader question, Paul. Uh, what I'm going to take from that is, does this, could this have implications for planning? So just looking at a city perspective, there are other cities in the world that are looking at, at, at equity and access to nature. So you can do analyses for neighborhoods, however you characterize neighborhoods, and how far are they to the closest park? Let's say a city owned park, are they 200 meters, 400 meters, 500 meters? And then when you're planning future parks or how to allocate your park budget, you could think about what um, communities are underserved and how could create more green space there. Um, something that I'm a little concerned is getting missed as we grow as cities, we're both growing out through sprawl, but hopefully we're doing more growing through intensification and moving more people to where we already have community infrastructure and transportation, those kinds of things. But as we add more people in and densify our cities, I'm not sure that we have a strategy around creating more green space so that people can access that all the time, including during a pandemic. So I think there's some questions around equity and planning and how we decide where new parks are, where we invest um, in green infrastructure could be done. I'm, I'm curious about that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Karen, <laughs> nobody else is asking any questions. I think you did a really, really good job um, bringing light to this. And I know that generally our community uh, are avid nature enthusiasts and I'm sure that uh, today in particular with it being so gorgeous out uh, there'll be more than just myself getting that vitamin in that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today and um, for telling us all about uh, the benefits of, of being in nature. It's fascinating stuff and it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting realm of research that I don't honestly think about that often. So thanks for that. And here I am. I was muted, I apologize. Can everybody hear me now? Yes, okay, great. <laughs> so this concludes our webinar for today in case I was muted and you didn't hear that. So I wanna say thank you to all of our panelists and participants for making today possible. Um, if you haven't joined as a member of the EAC, well, why not take a step and make our relationship official? Uh, being a member helps us to do our work better and make sure that you stay informed on webinars just like this one. So simply follow the link in the chat and uh, we hope that you'll consider joining our community. That would be so wonderful. Um, I'm having an issue with my picture, so we might not get to say goodbye physically, but I hope that you all enjoy the rest of the afternoon and that you're staying safe and well. Thank you so much for joining us today. And this concludes our webinar. <laughs>